How's everybody doing today? Good? Good Sunday? Lazy Sunday? Playing some more video games? Alright, so, real quick, before we dive in, uh, I want to introduce, so this is the science of human expression via live action content creation, highlighting individuality in an ever-growing field of independent developers, What Are Humans, presented by Forever and Astronaut. They cut our title short on the program. <laughs> about that but so the purpose of our talk um, we have spent the better part of a year and a half uh, being filmmakers that are really 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 interested in the game development community in st. Louis um, and we have been essentially living with butterscotch shenanigans filming everything that they've been doing for a year and a half and we've also been filming and talking to other game developers in st. Louis because you guys are so much cooler than the other filmmakers in st. Louis so, but for everybody else that's here that maybe isn't a game developer but is like us, interested in games and sort of the world of video games and the industry, um, it's St. Louis, let's be real, everyone out here today, you guys probably all, leave, all own three businesses apiece. So this can apply to any venture that you guys are going off and doing, be it a blog, a podcast network, like presenting yourself as an artist, anything, um, but we've kind of geared it towards like as a game developer. Um, but these are rules that you can apply to everything. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Yeah. And that's that's important for a lot of different reasons. Uh, most key being when you add a face to your company or organization or whatever kinds that you're producing, people are drawn to it more because they're like, oh, I know this person. We're like these now. faces. These faces. These, we're, we're, we're all friends here now because we're here doing this. Um, so yeah, like Leslie said, we are Forever Nationaut. I'm the uh, Rick Flair looking gentleman on the right. My name is James. Uh, my background is kind of in content curation of like the performance arts world. Uh, I did a lot of theater work for like St. Louis Fringe and that type of thing. I've helped bands over the years like curate concerts and all that jazz and I'm a filmmaker with Alessia. Exactly. And my name is Alessia Summerfield. As you can tell, I have uh, <laughs> gone through some things. Um, <laughs> I uh, essentially, I came to St. Louis, Missouri about three years ago, give or take, um, and I am actually Kind of a weird dude. I so I grew up as an Air Force brat, lived all over the country, uh, no ties or affiliations to anybody. I was like, I've got no country to call my own. Um, but then I fell in love with the South and lived in the South for a while. Um, spent three years in Atlanta in commercial video production. Um, got to work uh, with the cool people at Adult Swim. Um, recently got to work on the road with MTV for four months, so it's been kind of crazy. But so I come strictly from like commercial video production background. But I've been obsessed with video games like crazy since I was like four years old playing Wolfenstein 3D like cop like pirated on yeah. floppy disks like on my dad's like HP like Absolutely. or Packard Bell even. So but yeah, so this is who we are. Um, I'm gonna keep running over yeah, here and hit here. this button. Let's change. change. You see your yeah, so Forever an Astronaut is our company, um, as James alluded to. Um, we are a boutique video production company here in St. Louis. Um, and we just shoot films that we like to shoot. We've yeah. done documentaries on street vigilantes. Uh, we are currently doing documentaries on game developers via Dev Diary, so if you guys have seen anything online, that's what we've been doing. Um, but, that being said, we've worked with a lot of different people in the past doing a lot of different things. Yeah, it's been, it's been an interesting run so far with who all we've worked with and what we've done. Yeah, it's been, it's been There's fun. so many good people in St. Louis doing really good community-based things, and in the work that they do, putting themselves out there in that way, to establish themselves as that person that's helping up St. Louis. Yeah, absolutely. So it's all about sort of the face that you guys put out there. So we know that all of you guys are hardworking, dedicated, killer folks that all have great ideas. However, the problem that, especially with me being an out-of-towner, and, and just in general with James shifting from like theater event space to filmmaking, is that People see the work and people see the games, they hear the music, they see the films, but they have no idea who the people are behind it. And one thing that we've learned through working on Dev Diary is that people are extremely interested in those people that are working on the projects that you don't get FaceTime with, that you don't hear from. So the point of our talk is essentially to help you guys feel more comfortable putting yourself out there in front of your audience and sort of uh, breaking that fourth wall and making it a little bit more of like a two-way conversation as opposed to letting work just speak for itself. Um, because you want people to feel invested and you want people to feel like they know you, at least I do to some extent, because like we're all friends. It's yeah. supposed to be a creative, collaborative conversation.
conversation, yeah. be it film, be it any digital media like video games or anything like that. Yeah. Well, as filmmakers for a long time, we were very much like, oh, we'll just let the work speak for itself and that'll be great. And people will just be like, well, Forever National, not cool brand, cool guys. They'll just know. And then we kind of realized that, you know, people want to get to know us. We need to be out there being involved in the community and talking to people and be kind of on the ground floor, helping people understand what this brand is and what it wants to do for the city of St. Louis and beyond. Mm -hmm. Why we're here to yeah, exactly. see how that applies to all fields. So we're gonna stop tooting our horn and we're gonna start tooting some of you guys' horns in a not sexual way. <laughs> <laughs> um, are there children? Okay. Um, so first of all, we're gonna talk about some awesome local examples of community outreach and things that you can do to get connected to your audience and be more like available yeah. without like sacrificing your personal life. Because that's the thing, is like social media has kind of become like a pact with the devil, where it's yeah. like, you can do all these great things, but you can also lose yourself in the process and lose your personal time and all those things. So we found some really killer examples of people who aren't killing themselves or losing their personal life, but they're balancing it really, really well. Yeah. So first off is Graphite Lab. Yeah, it's been interesting. We, uh, in, in the process of doing Dumb Diary and like focusing on Butterscotch, we also realized like, I mean, there's so many great game developers in town, so we went and did these like pocket interviews with them, and in talking to Graphite Labs, we kind of uncovered that like their whole MO entirely has been to be very community-based and very engaged with their audience. Um, like Matt Rayfield and Matt Donatelli like every day are like on Twitter communicating with everybody. Every week they're doing these really great, awesome like Twitch streams where they're getting the community involved in like game days and that type of thing. They're here right now talking to people about Hive Jump. Like they're very involved and they're very excited to be involved. And I think that's the key thing is like as much promotion as they do, it's never felt like promotion. It's just felt like a couple of guys talking to you about the thing that they love and hoping that you love it too. And seeing something like that so clearly and so eloquently as they've done has been like really inspiring to us as filmmakers. And we're excited to uh, showcase more of that. Yeah, absolutely. More of like on a sort of like granular level, oh. the way that they've built out everything has been in a very, very neat and concise way. And for me, like from like an aesthetic technical background, I think a lot of this stuff is super helpful as well. So if you guys have a blog or you have a website, like doing something as simple as having all of your social media icons in a very clear place and doing certain things like with your Twitch streams, building out like an iframe or building out a frame around it that's got branding and links and like essentially, and James and Patrick were just talking right outside about like websites and how they've changed. So now it's it's less about how can I make my website look super crazy, GeoCities, GIF Mania, <laughs> Angel Fire, and more like how many clicks does it take to get the person you're trying to engage to the thing you're trying to engage them with. Mm -hmm. So the least amount of clicks, the better. Um, Graphite had an awesome like news blog thing that just had everything right there. Their Twitter feed is always super concise. Um, so just things to take into consideration if you guys are doing your own thing out there and you're kind of just like, well, how do I get people to engage yeah. more? Just make it easier. Um, obviously, Butterscotch, um, as we just talked about, we've been kind of fly on the wall uh, with them for a really long time, and they've gone through so many changes in the past year and a half, yeah. but the thing is, it's been so easy to follow from even outside of that sphere. Like, even if you're just like casually glancing at what they do online, um, it's so easy to follow along with them. So, in a lot of the ways, too, going back, is their Twitter feed is very concise. They show you the faces of their team members pretty much everywhere you go. It's even built into their logo. Um, and so it's so easy to just show up. You can, there's a podcast where they talk about just sort of the day-to-day -day that goes out consistently. Um, they do plenty of talks here in the community. Um, and they also, like, their YouTube page hasn't been updated in a little while. Um, but it's, whenever it was active, it was super consistent. And things were always coming out. And their website, again, as soon as you go to it, Boom, this is everything they're working on right now in your face. There it is. Yeah. Yeah, but one of the interesting things uh, that I really like that they do, especially is their, their podcast, um, they do it in such a way that it's not just them talking about like the industry stuff and, and the kind of granular nature of like what they do. It's, it's them kind of just talking to people. Like they do hit on all that, which is really great, but they also make sure to leave in like things about their personal lives and what's going on with them and letting the people that are tuning in like actually get to know them. For sure. Make it conversational, guys. Like, Self-promotion can feel icky and gross. Um, it feels icky and gross for the people you're promoting <laughs> to. So like, if you feel icky and gross about it, yeah. like shift gears, like don't be that like used car salesman and slick back hair guy. Cause I mean, that's not what we want. Right. Like the whole point is to have a conversation, like meet people and kind of 
push what you're doing in really cool, creative ways through unexpected avenues, and yeah, just be upfront about it. Right? Just be very personal. Who you are. And don't be afraid to be who you are. It's, it's fine. Exactly. Chances are, like, if you feel weird, like somebody else also feels weird. So you showing your weirdness is gonna make them like, oh, this is cool. No, they're just like me. All right, so uh, taking it out of the local sphere, we wanted to talk a little bit about international stuff. Um, it was funny, I've been following Team Beat for forever, and whenever I was like, we should add Team Beat to our presentation, James was like, who the hell is Team Beat? <laughs> and so I was like, no, no, no we have to. Um, so Edmund McMillan, I'm sure you guys are familiar with Indie Game the Movie to some extent. Um, he is the fella who has essentially been behind like Super Meat Boy, Binding of Isaac, Eugenics, which has kind of been here and there, um, and a bunch of other things. But the thing is, he's been so open with the community on Twitter, on his personal blog, um, and he's essentially just said yes to being in things like these movies that document him, being interviewed um, very upfront on like YouTube and stuff like that, and just, I don't know the man personally, but I feel like I do. And like that's the goal, is to like just feel like a friend and do the cool thing that you wanna do. Right. And uh, like, you just have, you, get, you gain so much support from people that way. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's interesting. So our other example is Ken Levine. Um, he did like irrational games in like the Bioshock series and all that jazz. Uh, and for me, what's really interesting about him is that one, he does the same type of thing. He's very open about interviews. He's very active on Twitter. He does a lot of like he writes a lot of blog posts, like article style. And uh, he's very open about like his insecurities and that type of thing. And to me, that's always been like this really interesting thing where it's like, oh, there's this really a well-known content creator that's doing these really cool things, and he's also being open about the fears that he has. That makes it a little bit easier for me as a content creator. Where I'm like, it's, it's okay to be afraid, and it's okay to feel this way. Everybody is like that. So him establishing that rapport with an audience and being upfront about who he is behind all of the crazy stuff that he's doing is fascinating. Absolutely. Um, and likewise, too, there are bad people. Um, and I'm not trying to say that these are like bad people. No. Um, so I personally have an affinity for Phil Fish's like plight, and like I understand where he comes from based on what all has been documented about it. So I'm not trying to say like boo, 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 these are terrible people, and we should like digitally bully human beings. But that being said, like Phil Fish did in turn become an internet bully. Yeah. And so essentially showing you these three faces, David Cage, who's done Heavy Rain and Beyond Two Souls mm -hmm. and is known for emotions. Um, and this is Phil Fish, who's known for Fez and Polytron, which I believe he has since sold? Yeah. I'm not quite sure. He's, still being he's out of the gaming industry for yeah, a he's, he's gone. And this is Peter Molyneux with yeah. red eyes. Um, so um, that being said, when you speak publicly and you put yourself in a fourth wall destroying situation where you need to be transparent with your audience, there's a difference between being transparent and being upfront yeah. and using those people as your punching bag and making a bunch of promises that you can't keep, which No Man's Sky might have needed to be on this slide as well. <laughs> um, but it's just like a slippery slope. Whenever you get involved, you need to be careful about the promises that you're making because people are going to hold you to them. Yeah. Um, and you need to be careful about the things that you say. Yeah. And, and have a plan. Be aware of how you're talking to people. Like, you know how you enjoy being communicated with. So, like, even though you might feel internally, like, very angry and very mistreated, like, don't then project that onto other people and make them feel that way, too. Because like, right? it will turn on you. They absolutely will. Absolutely. And people will turn on you, and likewise, your brand and what you're doing will Because, yeah. like, like, Fez is an amazingly beautiful game. But now Phil Fish has like tainted that game for so many people that when they see the game Fez, they don't want to play it because of the person who it's associated with. So what we're saying is do the opposite of that. Like make people want to play a game more because of the people attached to it. Exactly. Um, I have tours here with a question mark because um, especially with like Hideo Kojima and all the things that have been happening with Konami and things like that, Things are different whenever you say like Metal Gear Solid, a Hideo Kojima game. Like it's one thing to have other people call you an auteur and have other people say that you're doing really interesting, creative, engaging work. And it's another thing altogether to be self-proclaiming to do those things. And I think what like Eastern developers don't necessarily put themselves out there on Twitter and stuff like that, like Phil Fish. I know some of them do. Um, but the thing is, is like with people like Hideo Kojima, I feel like the whole auteur thing is more like a filmmaker thing. Yeah. And that cult of personality in filmmaking is kind of dangerous. 
Um, so just be careful when you're using big lofty words to describe the work that you're doing, I think is my warning flag to everybody. And now let's talk about like actual things. So I know we just showed you guys a whole bunch of examples and we can sit up here and talk about theoretics and all this stuff all day long. I don't know what you guys are doing all individually, but we came up with some tips from our backgrounds, from managing marketing and social media and doing all this sort of commercial production that we wanted to kind of facilitate. Outside of this, we want to have like a Q&A with you guys, um, but we wanted to kind of throw out these yeah. tips. Yeah, I mean, by far, like, you can start simple. Like, it's totally fine to start simple as long as you start something. Um, in addition to, like, performing art stuff, like, I worked for a lot of nonprofits, and a lot of the nonprofits I worked for really never understood the use of social media and how it can relate to their business. Um, but just doing simple things like posting to Facebook once in a while, posting like a journal, journal or a blog, like these things do a lot to engage your customers and engage your potential audience and to let them know, not even just like who you are, but like what you're offering to the community and to get your name out there. Like it goes so much further from just like community engagement at that point, it helps with like your search engine op optimization. Like the more stuff you have out there, the more honest it is, and the more it Years. And the more people see it, the more they'll share it, which is great. And then you get more elaborate, which is kind of the thing that we really like to do. Um, we like to do a lot of events, and we like to go out and like be in the community. So things like doing a talk like this, having like an open house at your workspace, which works in some cases. Yeah, some cases doesn't. Not. Like yeah. have an open house at like a bar, like have a meetup. The game dev community here does like these great drink ups, which as a non-game developer, I love to go to, and I love hearing about what everybody's working on. Like those are fantastic. And just like in general working with other people in the community, like when you're curating this content, help other people, not necessarily help other people curate their content, but communicate with them and like guest on their things and have them guest on your things if you're doing a podcast or something like that. Be communicative, communicative and open with everybody around you. And if the people around you are elevated, you'll also be elevated with them. It's kind of been our yeah. philosophy going forward so far. For sure. And like high tides raise all ships. So yeah. like there's no point, like specifically, so as a parallel to, so game developers have been very, very, all the game developers that we've talked to and worked with in St. Louis have been super, super enthusiastic, energetic, positive. The flip side to that is the filmmaking community, not just in St. Louis, but just in general, is very dog eat dog, like sniping work yeah. from other people and just like a lot of like very LA, I don't know. It's, it's the same thing with the theater community. A lot of them work together really well now, but like back like five years ago, it was very doggy dog. Nobody wants to help each other out because yeah. we're fending for ourselves. And there's this perception that there's not enough work for everyone, yeah. but that's not the case at all. And so helping each other just makes the work that much tighter, makes the community that much like tighter knit. And it just, I don't know, it works so well. And I, I think that James definitely hits the nail on the head for sure. Um, that being said as well, it's easy to get overwhelmed helping other people and, and subverting your own energies from the project that you're working on. So you should be honest with yourself and honest with other people whenever you assist them because you don't want to get in a situation where you're letting a bunch of people down because they thought you were going to assist in a certain way. That being said, we all work in a digital space for the most part. Um, other than like artists and musicians, like so musicians, it's interesting because like other than concerts, musicians work with physical things much like filmmakers but it ends up as a digital byproduct, whereas game developers, it's kind of all digital all the time for the most part, unless you can get something on a store shelf. That being said, I, and this might be just because I'm a lunatic and have like 500 vinyl records at home and like obsessed over physical tchotchkes, but like I think that there's a lot of importance in physical communication and physical products, and a lot of us can't have physical products with the nature of what we do. So it's really, really important to bridge that gap between digital and physical and like get people in a room interacting, laughing, and especially seeing people's faces when they work, when they use the thing that you've put time into can help out tremendously. Yeah. So that being said as well, consistency I think is a big, big, big thing. If you guys are doing a podcast or you're doing a blog or you're running a game development company, Whatever it is that you are doing, you need to be consistent with the work that you are putting out there. So if you are going to utilize Facebook, if you are going to utilize Twitter, if you are going to utilize Instagram, you absolutely have to make sure that every, like once a week there's a post going out, or once a week there's a photo going out, or once a week there's something, or not once a week, twice a week, or yeah. once every two weeks, or whatever, 
Because the thing is, if you use your Instagram like I do personally, <laughs> and you post like 35 pictures in a week, and then you're dead for like three months, it's not going to build any sort of traction. There's not going to be any sort of snowball. People aren't going to check it anymore. And the most important thing, and this has happened a lot, is with feeds, it stops sharing what you're doing with people. So one big thing with Facebook is that if you embed an outside video file to Facebook, like a YouTube video or a Vimeo video or anything like that, it will bury it. Facebook only wants to promote its own internal mechanisms. So post your videos, like physically upload them to Facebook and then share those. Yeah. Um, finding little tips like that, just take some time to like research before you put something out there, build a plan and be consistent about that plan no matter what it is that you're doing. Because people want to consistently see things. Yeah, yeah, and if you're consistent with it, you have kind of a reliable schedule. People know when to expect things from you, which makes it easier for them to know what you're doing. Whereas if you post like once every three months, they're like, "Well, that's not in my head. I'm not actively thinking about this." Like we all think about ourselves more than we than other people think about us. So it's easy to be like, "Oh, they're going to absolutely see this even though I haven't posted in a year and a half." Yeah, they won't. And so the importance of building a backlog as well, if you're going to do something like a podcast or anything that's like regular like that, it's good to have a backlog before you start, because once people start expecting the content, they're going to continue expecting it. And if you get behind, the work will suffer, and then your audience will suffer. And nobody wants that. For sure. Um, and likewise, guys, experiment. Um, it's good to show your weird side. It's good to show sort of what makes you a human being, like a unique person, and not just Facebook account number 637. Um, let people get to know the real you, like do a Q&A session, put yourself out there. It sucks because you have to make yourself vulnerable and it sucks to be vulnerable, especially around a bunch of strangers, but like you need to do that. Um, and always have a plan for your plan, for your plan, for your plan. So like have a million plans in place so that if something fails horrendously, you're not stuck just sitting there going, what did I do? Right. You can immediately revert to plan B, plan C, plan D, et cetera, et cetera, ad infinitum forever. Um, and embrace the unexpected and be agile and nimble when it happens. Because all of us are small groups for the most part. I mean, here in St. Louis, like there are a couple development companies that have like a fair amount of people. But for the most part, like we're all small little pockets of people doing our own thing. We're one or two people, three people here and there. Um, so use that to your advantage. Like we're not a hundred person studio that takes 75 days to steer the ship an inch. We are agile and nimble people. So if you see that something's not working, be quick to, to adjust it and reframe and move forward, but don't let it paralyze you. Don't constantly second guess what you're doing. So anyway, that's us waxing philosophical for however long it's been. We want to open the floor to you guys and hear things from you guys. Is any of that helpful? Do you guys want to know more about specific things? Are we not? I got a question about the content. Yeah. From outside sources. Yeah. Does um, Instagram and Facebook coincide pretty well? Does they, think, doesn't Facebook own it? Yeah, Facebook owns Instagram. So like Instagram stuff gets posted like to the very top because it's where Facebook's yeah. mm -hmm. For sure. Because I share a lot of my videos on yeah. both Snapchat and Instagram and Instagram and Facebook. Absolutely. For sure. And it's super smart to build like a chain like that so that you're not having to like do it manually and then you forget. So like even setting up your Twitter to like auto feed to your website or whatever, set up little chains like that. It's a super smart idea. It's Facebook issues. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I think everybody is social media marketing, so for sure. <laughs> for sure. Pat? Would you advise um, sticking to one platform of social media and focusing on that than sort of spreading thin? Variety. I'm about to quit Facebook. I just I care less, honestly. Yeah, I so we are a little spread thin ourselves yeah. to the point where we had like an intern manage several of our platforms because we just couldn't. And I hated it. I hate every minute of that. And yeah. I think you should stick to what you enjoy and what is best for your yeah. brand of yeah. content and just like dedicate. That, that's exactly right. Like it's good to understand like the content that you're putting out, like where that needs to live. Uh, I would say though for like update stuff, like it's good to post that as many places as you can, just get more eyes on it, but I find for us, like conversationally and like engagement with fans and that type of thing, Twitter's been the best yeah. for that type of thing, so I totally feel we should have that best. Yeah. Yeah. Twitter's been the best. let Facebook die. Yeah. yeah. But should we just get rid of it, or should I just leave it and occasionally post big things? I, I would say have it so you can post the big things there, but... Everyone that follows us on, on Facebook is basically like high school friends. Well, yeah. I, I don't really care. Well, it's like, it's, 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 it's so situation. Facebook isn't helping us. Like, yeah. Put that as a cover photo. I don't care about it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, it's like I got a page. I like to leave and look at 
Yeah, for sure. To get right. more than like 10 people out of 300 people to follow us on Facebook, even look. You know, so right. Yeah. Well, and again, with being agile and nimble, if you see that like this is working, yeah. and this isn't like. I think I'm just going to shift that way. Yeah, for sure. It's gone. Yeah. I'll never even speak. Do it. <laughs> 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 we won't talk about it ever again. <laughs> <laughs> we have time for one more question. Anybody? Any questions? Comments? Thumbs up, everybody. Thumbs down. Oh, good. Thank good. You. Cool. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. <laughs>